Well, they're unusual in the sense that statistically it's unusual. Uh, you could say it's a, st a statistical anomaly, statistical fluke. There's no reason to think that earthquakes are occurring any more frequently now than they, than they occurred last year or 10 years ago or 10 years into the future. There's no reason to believe that. And it has nothing to do with global warming. Believe me, that's a question that we often get. Now, one of the things we learn as seismologists is that earthquakes can occur at any time in any place. In fact, they don't even have to occur at plate boundaries, for that matter. But that's, that's a whole other topic. Uh, but along some of the major plate boundaries, like uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, we have evidence of past earthquakes. And that actually is an, is an interesting thing. Obviously, we didn't have instruments going back more than about 100 years or so. So we don't have an instrumental record. But we have a record from uh, newspaper, old newspapers, for example. We have a record from uh, some old mission records, particularly in California, Spanish mission records, and elsewhere throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we have very long uh, historical records in China and Japan and, and in parts of Asia where people have been writing things down for quite a few centuries. Uh, but in some places, we simply don't have that written record, and we have to rely, again, on proxies. Um, there are a couple of things we can do in a place like uh, California or Seattle. Let's take California first. Uh, one thing we can do when we have a fault like the San Andreas is to actually dig a trench across that fault. And when we trench across faults like that, and you do that trenching at, at different places, you can actually see in the disturbed soil the record of past earthquakes. It may occur every 150 or 200 or three or 400 years, uh, but with very good carbon dating or other geological techniques, uh, we can get a good sense of what that history is. And by doing that trenching at various places along the fault, we can even get a, an estimate of the, of the size of the rupture, which gives us a way to calculate the magnitude. That then allows us to calculate the repeat interval, say, for these very large earthquakes. In Seattle, or I should say more generally off the coast of um, uh, British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon, going down into Northern California, that's a different kind of a plate boundary. It's what we call a subduction zone. It's a convergent boundary. It creates the cascades and the volcanoes. Uh, so we can't trench it. Um, but what we can do is look at the history of uplift on the coast, because every time an earthquake occurs, uh, the upper plate, which is basically the coast of Washington and Oregon and Northern California, gets bumped up a little bit. And by looking at the sedimentary record, actually, it sometimes can go down as well, but you know, at, at looking at the sedimentary record, uh, looking at the way, say, even trees are drowned by encroaching water or lifted above the water table or so on, uh, you can get a sense of the history. Uh, uh, people who look at things like tree rings or the history of corals, uh, there aren't any corals up there now, but if we go elsewhere around the world, we see that. Uh, these are all proxies for past big earthquakes. There's another proxy, which um, in particular for the uh, Pacific Northwest works, and that is uh, earthquakes along that boundary have a tendency to generate a tsunami. And when a tsunami propagates move, or moves across the Pacific Ocean, particularly a big one, when it hits islands uh, on the other side of the Pacific, uh, you get what's called tsunami deposits. It's a, it's a very turbulent phenomenon. It brings up pebbles and rocks and disturbs the beaches. And uh, you can detect some of those. Um, but in particular, for the, for the particular case of the Pacific Northwest, uh, Around 1700, actually in 1700, a tsunami was generated. It was recorded in Japan. And by looking at the uh, tsunami records in Japan, both the historical record and the actual geologic record of the tsunami, modelers have been able to kind of back project that, go backwards across the Pacific, show that the source of that tsunami was in fact the Pacific Northwest and get a good date, 1700. Uh, for that event. That event looks like to be about a magnitude nine, nine and a half. That's bigger than what we had in Chile last, uh, j just a few weeks ago. Uh, and it's about as big as the biggest earthquake we've recorded instrumentally. So now that we know that that boundary can support uh, a monstrous earthquake, a magnitude nine, we can go about the job of measuring the w how fast the plates are converging, making some assumptions about how stress is building up, and come up with some sense of what the repeat interval might be for that earthquake. 
And uh, sad to say, we're pretty close to the repeat interval for that earthquake. So that's a forecast. It's not a prediction. It's a forecast. And thankfully, at least in the United States, going back a decade or more, uh, Seattle and Oregon have been well aware of the potential for that earthquake, and they're taking the appropriate steps, one would say, to try to mitigate the potential damage. Mm -hmm.